And I think if, um, if I can be succinct enough that this may be the last in our series of the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. And these, uh, this, this series is a culmination of the series on who is Jesus. And we looked through um, the book of Luke and looked at the different ways that Jesus identified himself, or was identified. And uh, we are finishing that study by looking at the I am statements. And we actually have a couple left, and we're gonna cover quite a bit of, of uh, scriptural ground today uh, in order to do that. But I want us to think of the I am statements as a journey that uh, Jesus laid out and that they are presented in the Gospels in chronological order and in an order that gives a, an umbrella message, a complete message, in addition to the examination of each I am statement. We also recognize that here, since the um, I am the resurrection and the life that we talked about last Sunday and the miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus after four days in the grave, that if you look at the book of John and you look at the chronology, you'll see pretty quickly the triumphant entry. So, so um, the resurrection of Lazarus so ignited the hatred of the Pharisees and other religious leaders because they were facing some competition uh, for their affections and for their offerings. And so they plotted to kill him. And instead, Jesus escapes their grasp because it was not his time. And he goes to what we know of as the triumphal entry, which should have been the pinnacle of his adoration and success and mission, but it was really kind of the beginning of the end of the beginning and further annoyed and aggravated the religious and political leaders of the day. So when we look at these final I am statements, we are looking at the context of Jesus' imminent crucifixion. And so what we see in the context of these things, they can stand on their own, certainly. The, the, the statements are, are ripe for analysis and, and theological study and interpretation. Uh, so they stand on their own. But when we look at all of them in the context of his teaching of his disciples, this is a, uh, a very intense transitional time for his disciples. He keeps telling them, I'm going to die. I'm going to go away, and the disciples know nothing. And think about their background. They are Jews who know God only from afar and through sacrifice and through a high priest who's the only way to get to God the Father. And then they see this man who keeps telling them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So they now have this, this person that they can hear and communicate with and touch, as Thomas did after the resurrection, this, this flesh and blood human incarnation of God, and they have dealt with him for three, three and a half years, is our best guess. And so now he's saying, oh, I'm going away, at the very time that they think that he's going to take over, kick out the Romans, and restore the majesty of Israel in Jerusalem. So this very difficult time for them. What I want us to do, what I would like to do, is to guide you through a path of a lost person, a truly lost person. Have any of you ever been out in the woods and were not sure how to find your way home, that you were lost at some period of time, all right? Um, that's a scary feeling. Now, I haven't been lost in the woods. I always knew where I was, um, or at least thought I knew where I was, but I've been lost in 
cities, right? Um, I don't trust GPS anymore. I, 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 I don't think it's really being honest with me a lot of the time. Um, and I think, I think artificial intelligence was built into GPS because it apparently has a sense of sick humor. <laughs> Taking me places I don't want to go. Um, and the closest I've had to a panic attack, I'm a little claustrophobic, so I've had a couple of real, like, get me out of here kind of moments. Um, two that I can think of. That goes back to my brother locking me in an army footlocker when I was a kid, but that's a whole different story. Um, but the other was I was in Denver trying to get to a meeting. I was on the clock trying to get there before a certain time for, for a, 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 a peace officer meeting. And uh, of course, all of us in Colorado that live on the Front Range orient our directions by mountains west, right? Amen. That's why I was so confused in the San Luis Valley for eight years, because there's mountains everywhere you look. Um, and so I, I have a little bit of a sense of what it's like to be lost. Now, if you are lost for some period of time, I think about that poor astronaut that just got back. He was supposed to be up there for six months, and uh, the uh, Russian rescue ship uh, had carburetor trouble or something, and, and so he had to wait another six months floating up there. And it, if you could just get a sense of what it's like maybe to be lost in the desert, and if you've been lost long enough that you thought you had enough food and water, but you're running out of food and water, that's a real panicky feeling. Um, any of you watch the uh, Lost and Alone or the Alone series where they drop people off and see how long they can survive? There's a lot of uh, scariness in that. Um, so, so think about a person who is lost, and obviously you can take that to the spiritual metaphor, and think about the sequence of these I am statements that Jesus gave to his disciples. And if you remember, the first one was, I am the bread. Now, if you're lost and feel abandoned, what's the first thing that you want? Well, it's, it's uh, food and water, right? So he says to the lost person, at least in, in the way that I'm framing this today, I'm the bread of life. I am the sustenance. I am the rescue morsel. I am the thing that you need very desperately. I am the thing that satisfies. And then the next is the light. Yeah. I am the light. Now if you're lost and you're looking for direction, and particularly, obviously, if you're in the nighttime, then what you're looking for is a light. Whether it's a searchlight on the shore, whether it's a light from the rescue helicopter, whether it's a, uh, a light from a distant campfire, you can move toward the light and you can, you can sense the warmth of the light and, and the illumination of the light. And the light opens up your world somewhat. And then he moves, again sequentially, to the gate. Not only is there satisfaction for survival, not only is there a direction in which to go, but there is also a place to go, a place of safety. And Jesus uses two illustrations with him as the shepherd and us as the sheep. And he says, I'm the gate to get into the place of safety. And while you're in the place of safety and when you're out running around looking for grass and water, I am also the good shepherd. So you, you, you see the picture that I'm drawing here. From bread to light to refuge to safety. And then he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. So we have rescue beyond the moment. We have eternity to look forward to. We have the assurance of an eternal purpose and an eternal presence and an eternal uh, eternal fellowship with God. And now we come to the last two I am's. And let's begin in uh, John chapter 14. 
This is such a rich set of verses. I hope that I can do justice to it uh, in the next 15 minutes or so uh, to uh, let you get going in a timely manner. I don't usually preach from notes, but I do make notes in my Bible, and that's kind of a fairly new habit. You won't see that too much, but this is just so rich. I made all kinds of notes, and, and uh, I, I, they're obviously not in any particular order. Just as they come to me, I have to find the margin for them. But we'll start for the sake of uh, a beginning somewhere with verse 14. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. Now again, if you can put yourself in the disciples' shoes and have them hearing this message from the one that they thought was going to be the conqueror. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. You know where I'm going, he says. And the Lord says, no, we don't. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, we can talk about the exclusivity of this statement. Oh, there's 3,000 gods. Why should we just follow one? Uh, Jesus never claimed to be God. We've overcome that, in, hopefully, in this sermon series. Um, uh, there are plenty of ways to God. All paths lead to... No. If you're going to be a follower of Christ and you're going to believe in this word as trustworthy, then you're going to have to pay attention to this exclusive statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And further, no man comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. So in this path of from lostness to foundness, Jesus says, I'm the way. I'm the way. Where, where are we going to go? Where, where, where are you going to go? How, how am I going to Just follow me. Follow my teachings. Follow what I tell you. Trust me. And um, then Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Um, now, again, I don't want to insert an inflection in the voice of Jesus 2,000 years from when he said it, but, uh, and it's not explicitly in the scripture, but can you hear Jesus going, Have I been among you all this time and you do not know me? I think that know me would be a good word study. I didn't do it, but, but you might want to. The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe me because of the works themselves. If you don't believe my voice, believe what you've seen with your own eyes. You just saw me raise somebody from the dead. Where'd you think that power came from? You've heard me speak, and people all over are in awe at the authority. Nobody ever spoke like this. Believe that, Philip, if you don't believe anything else. And then Jesus, again, he's, he's telling this to the disciples who he is going to leave, going to send the Holy Spirit, which they have very little concept of. But he's giving them some comfort. Um, and by the way, I tell you, no one who believes in me, uh, it, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will even do greater works than these. Now, we're believers. We have followed Jesus historically and personally. And so the question is, have you done things greater than Jesus did? Well, if we think about the collective authority and purpose and mission of the church, Catholic Church, small c, global church, what we have done across history as a people is absolutely, hugely greater. Jesus never went more than a couple hundred miles from this little circle over in the desert in the Middle East. And yet, 
His word, his teaching, this Bible is now globally known. Yes. Hundreds of languages, hundreds of missionaries, hundreds of world movements. And if you don't believe that the reason that we have a welfare system and uh, elder care and uh, orphanages and places of respite and health care and education we can claim historically that that is because of Christianity. Um, so in that sense, it's certainly been true. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. This is a pretty constant theme here in this verse as Jesus was about to go. Um, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He's the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him. So that's a, that's a Trinitarian theology that that's not, not, they're not gonna grasp that until Pentecost. And that's why Jesus said, why don't you just go hang out in a quiet place and see what happens. Um, I will not leave you as orphans. So, um, again, in, in uh, verse 23, as Jesus, uh, a, a Judas, not the Judas, said, Lord, how are you going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and he will come to me and make our home with me. Now, we know that we are a people of faith in grace and mercy and the gift of salvation, not of works. But Jesus is saying, look, if you're going to be a follower of me, that will definitely manifest itself in good works. So that we just have, we just have to understand uh, differently than the way the world understands Christianity. Oh yeah, good works, you get to heaven. No. no. Accept Christ, you're on your way to heaven, you will do good works because that's what Jesus did. He went about doing good as do we. I've spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, and will teach you all things, remind you of everything I've told you. And then he says, peace I leave with you my peace I give to you oh people if you do not have peace I don't like bumper sticker religion but that one that says no Jesus you know no peace you know no Jesus K-N-O-W no peace K-N-O-W uh, very true very true if you do not have peace, let me suggest two things. You are not fully committed to trusting Christ. And I'm not trying to blame the victim here. But you're not fully committed to trusting Christ. Or you're just in a season of confusion and disruption, which happens in normal human life. It happens to the Christian. And peace will come. And we are to be, remember when, when the... Uh, Jesus was on the boat and uh, all the disciples were on there and they were thinking, oh, we're going to die. Oh my gosh, what's going on? Somebody go get Jesus and Jesus is just like that. So we should be just like that. that I don't want to make you feel guilty if you don't have peace. But I'm just saying that Jesus is promising peace and we can access it. But one of the ways that we access it is by being a consistent follower of Christ, a learner of Christ, a possessor of Christ. And listen what he says in chapter 15, verse 1. Here's the last I am statement. I am the true vine. So you see the sequence? From lost to being plugged in to the very source of life and the source of the continuity of life and the source of meaning of life and the source of behavior I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Now, we could start digging a hole into the doctrine of the, um, uh, of the uh, whether you can lose your salvation or not. Um, in, in my stance is... Uh, that no one will pluck them out of my hand. So if you've, if you've given your life to Christ, um, then that is sustained by Christ, not by our own works or even our own faith. And so uh, later on, I think in the uh, uh, 
uh, one of the three John epistles. Um, it says, well, we lost some of you, you, but you were never part of us to begin with. Yeah. And so uh, that, that's my stand on that, and, and, and uh, it's worthy of discussion. But so I, I don't think this is, I think this is what it's saying. If you, um, if you uh, claim, remember that's what I think is the scariest verse in the Bible, one of two scariest verses in the Bible. Uh, is when somebody gets to heaven and Jesus says, I don't even know you. Yes. Yeah, but Lord, I did all these good things in your name. Yeah, mm, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not seeing you. No, don't know you. So we don't, want, we don't want that. That's the kind of branch that's going to get lopped off. But for the rest of us, there's a pruning process, which means cutting for better growth. And there's a whole great sermon about suffering and about discipline and about hardship and about character building, but that's not my sermon today. But Jesus says this in verse four, remain in me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I want to note when we, when we talk back in uh, um, around verse 12 uh, or verse 13 in the previous chapter, whatever you ask in my name, if you'll just look at in a reference book for the phrase in my name, you'll see that almost all of the Old Testament uses of that phrase in King James is from prophets who falsely lie in my name, and there's a punishment attached. Now, when you come to the New Testament and you see the words, in my name, Jesus is saying, if you are aligned with my will as a follower who has remained attached and nourished by the vine, your prayers will be answered. So, this remaining did a little word study on that. Here's some synonyms. To abide, to camp out, to dwell, to rest in, to continue in. So when we talk about these deep issues of free will, for example, this is Jesus saying, you make the effort to remain in me and I will be in you. My friends, Christian discipleship is not being in a boat coasting downstream in the flow of the Christian life and ceremony. It is an act of will. Sometimes it's resting in the stream, sometimes it's paddling furiously, but it is an act of will. And Jesus continues to give assurances throughout the balance of this gospel. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love as an act of will. What are we willfully, intentionally, <coughs> deliberately, furiously, regularly, in a disciplined way, what are we doing to remain in him? You know what my primary prescription for remaining in Christ is, right? Daily doses, daily doses, massive doses, regular doses. Don't skip that prescription. And I'm so proud that so many of you uh, are doing that. And what did Jesus do to stay close to the Father? He retreated, he prayed, he rested, and he prayed. So those two questions, in terms of our intentional efforts to remain in Christ, what are we doing in our prayer life? And what are we doing in our retreat life? What are we doing in our resting life.
What are we doing to take time to spend with God? I've said this about parenting. I've said this about marriage. The primary ingredient in relationship is time. It is time. Oh, it's not just quality time. It's not program time. It's not great vacation time. It is just raw time. Living together, experiencing life together, bouncing off of each other, iron sharpening iron, this is how we remain in Christ. So we pray, we retreat and rest. God gave us a Sabbath for a reason, gave us the principle of Sabbath for a reason. And we are not the branch of the vine. We are a branch of the vine, and you are other branches in the vine. And so the necessity of fellowship and Christian relationships is again part of the intentional um, will of the Lord for our lives. Now in the vein of um, remaining in the vine and discipleship, we're going to move into a study of Christian behavior, Christian character, Christian uh, discipleship, and uh, we might call it the um, sanctification process, right? Should Christians be different than the average non-Christian? Absolutely. We're gonna talk about those ways. We're gonna talk about how to refine ourselves, how to become more spiritually healthy, which will make us more mentally healthy, more relationally healthy, and um, more Christ-like. The problem with becoming more Christ-like is uh, Jesus got adored and appreciated, but he also got struck, spat on, and executed. And so as we move into a, uh, a, a season of learning how to be more Christ-like, we also need to learn how to expect challenges, how to put on the full armor of God, and how to push through without the human reaction of anger and resentment and revenge, but to operate in the midst of trouble with grace, love, and mercy as Jesus did. Um, and again, that's one of those things we kind of assume. We live in a culture, I grew up in a, uh, in a culture where, man, if you were saved, we expected your addiction to be gone. If you were saved, we expected your life to change by Monday evening. And you know what? Doesn't always happen that way. So we're going to sharpen the stone a little bit, iron versus iron. I hope to offend some of you, but I'm always going to be preaching into the mirror. Amen. Believe that. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the lesson that you gave us for the path of how you revealed yourself in the I am statements that uh, John so faithfully recorded for us. We want to embrace all of who you say that you are and be intentional in our discipleship. And we pray that prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.